It's an exciting day. We're launching 84 days of soaring. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you and say, it's time to soar. It's time to soar. That's it. Who needs a t-shirt over here? I saw a first hand go up in the middle. I see that hand. I think I got it to you. I tried to get it to you. Let's go back. Let's go back. White shirt. Oh, bouncing, bouncing. All right. <laughs> Nobody's hurt. That's one of our goals. And then gifts just keep coming out. It's time to soar. We have a lot to celebrate what God is doing, including around the world. The faders are with us today. We have international partners over 40. Sometimes they're back. The faders are back here today. I don't think it's the only reason they came back, but they're here for the launch. So if the faders could stand up, Eli and Bethany, there we go, right over here. <clears throat> They also have five children. They have been serving in Uganda and also South Sudan. Their ministry includes teaching, training. They're learning a lot as they're doing that, connecting with people, loving people, building up leaders. They also care for refugees, and they have a prison ministry. There's a lot happening, and we are so honored to be connected with places like Uganda. We, God loves people from around the world, and we want Uganda and America. You know, we want to walk in the love of God together. So we're grateful for your ministry. They also have five kids. You can meet them in the hall. But this is a global soaring, and it's also local compassion clinic. What we just saw, we're hosting for the first time. We've participated before, and it's always a collaboration with a bunch of other churches because we're all about unity. But now we get to host this month, so lots of different roles. You can get involved there. And today's the kickoff, but it really feels like it was Friday because we had a night here of worship, prayer with the elders, communion, scripture. And how many of you know when you lift up Jesus, he will draw people to himself? And five people, we had baptism ready and five people came forward and said, I'm ready. Follow Jesus, get baptized. And we celebrated together. <laughs> Soaring is already happening. Soaring is already happening. Now, where are we? If you're new to grace, we've been walking through a trilogy of Just Choose Hope because it's a choice every day. Hope is available. The indestructible hope of Jesus, the infinite hope of Jesus. God wants to fill us to overflowing. We started out with 28 days of hope, and this was a chance to return to God. If God did that much in 28 days, just imagine what he's going to do in 84 days. And this was a time we're returning to also to his word. A lot of families would study the Bible, pray together like they never had before in their homes and roommates as well. God was doing something new. And then this summer, 12 weeks of unity. Why? Because we can't do it alone. We're not designed to be isolated. We need God. We need each other. We strengthen relationships this entire summer. We want to soar together. And this is a preparation now as we go into the fall and we're going to look at the book of Acts. Soaring comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Those who hope in the Lord. That's a good choice to hope in the Lord. They will renew their strength and they will soar on wings like eagles. God wants to strengthen us and God wants to provide, empower, encourage us so that we can soar. It doesn't mean life's easy, but it means we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we're going to enter into this season together, united, to set the table. There's a booklet here. Uh, last week, these were available. I think there's over a thousand gone, so we made a lot more. In the lobby, you can grab one of these. This will walk you through the entire book of Acts in 84 days. There's scripture to read, there's a devotion, there's questions to reflect, there's an opportunity to write some things down, and then each day there's a QR code because we have 84 videos that cover that scripture as well. It's set up for you so that you can spend time with God. Linger with God. Enjoy your time with God. Grow deeper with God. That's why uh, we've created this. And so seek the Lord. And if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. That's the booklet. Make sure you grab one. We also have life groups. And in the back of the booklet, life group questions. If you're new to Grace, we have over 80 life groups. We have two things here that are core. Our gathering as a family, but then also our gathering in homes and in life groups. And both are important because this room's big. And we just had a couple of questions, but you're not going to have a long conversation during this hour with someone. But when you start to meet with the same people in the same place every week and you're in scripture and you're, God starts moving and transforming lives. And so we encourage you, you can text life group to the church phone number. You can fill out the connecting card to go to the connecting center. And if you are individually in God's word, 
going through the book of Acts. In a life group, going through the book of Acts. In our whole church family, going through the book of Acts. Do you see what God is setting up here? God's spirit, his word, his people. There's no limits to what God can do in 84 days. So let's listen to the Lord. Let's take that step of faith together. And this is a time of soaring. Today we're gonna cover the power to soar, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and your kindness and your patience, God. Thank you for all that you have planned. And most of all, thank you for your presence. God, we say yes to you today. And we humble ourselves before you. We turn from sin right now, God. We turn to you, Jesus. We lift up our eyes to you. Lead us, good shepherd. We want to abide with you. We want to grow closer to you. We want to be like you. We want to lead people to you. And Father, we can't do it on our own. So we trust you today. And we want to walk in your love and your light. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Soaring is saying yes to God. What is soaring? Saying yes to God. Saying yes to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it this way in John 10, 10. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy but I have come that you may have abundant life. That abundance is both eternal. We're gonna be with God forever through the resurrection of Jesus. And then also every day there's an abundance that God provides for us and his grace is sufficient. So it's daily and it's eternal. This is what God offers. And when we enter into these 84 days, our prayer and vision is in four specific areas because God works in many ways at the same time. Our hearts, our homes, our church family, and our cities. We're praying that God's presence in those four places of our life, starting with our hearts and then our homes where we spend the most time, into our church family, and then this is the most hope-filled place in our city, not the casino, right here is the most hope-filled place in our city. And then from that overflow, the, the city is gonna experience God like never before. And we're entering in together, united with faith. And as we look at the book of Acts, know that the Holy Spirit is the author of the entire Bible. This is God's word, eternal, trustworthy, reliable. And the Holy Spirit wrote through many different people. Acts was written by Luke, the physician who wrote the gospel of Luke. And he has an incredible eye for details and historical facts. You're gonna appreciate that as you go through the book of Acts. Now, when it comes to soaring, I think after Jesus ascended, The church sensed it's time to soar. And they weren't quite sure, what does this look like? After they've been with Jesus, what does it look like to live for Jesus? And we are thinking through that same thing today. What does it look like to live for Jesus today? And here's the shifts. Instead of going to church, we want to be the church. Instead of just studying the book of Acts, which is good, we want to do the book of Acts and be a doer of the word. And instead of, you probably noticed a difference, instead of cultural Christianity, we want biblical Christianity. And right now there's a massive gap between cultural Christianity and biblical Christianity. And we want that chasm to disappear. We want to trust God coming back to his word and his presence. That's the journey we're on together. And today we're going to highlight four truths about soaring. Soaring. First one, you must rely and receive to soar. You cannot save yourselves and you cannot soar on your own strength. It's all about relying and receiving from God. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, we read, After Jesus' suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. At the core of our faith is the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's called the good news. Whenever we're talking about the good news, this is the gospel. Two things. Jesus died for our sins and he's risen from the grave. This is not a blind faith. He appeared to over 500 people and 500 witnesses. If 500 people came up to you today and said, this is what I just saw, that would get your attention. All of these witnesses, all of this evidence, you can't find the body in the tomb. This is not dead religion and just rules and rituals. This is our living hope and living Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice they were convinced. Why? Because of what they experienced. 
They were convinced that he's the Savior and Messiah, and they are called. They are called to receive and give the hope of Jesus every day. How convinced are we? How called are we? Convinced and called is a great combination. Convinced is that deep place of conviction where you know the truth and the truth sets you free. Jesus is the truth. And then called, not just to sit around on a chair knowing that fact, but called to make a difference, to go love our neighbors and step out of our comfort zone. You can't soar in the nest. God has never called us to sit in a comfortable nest. And so we are convinced and we are called. Do this one more time. Turn to the person next to you and say, convinced and called. Now, Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Look at the unity together. They all joined, they are together, constantly in prayer. That's where you receive. Along with the women and the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They are united as one family, all ages, uh, men and women, uh, different, not only generations, but nations in the body of Christ. This will be called a house of prayer for all nations. I'm so glad that our church family is looking more and more like heaven all the time. And God has called us to unite and to pray. Unity glorifies God. Prayer gives us more access to God. And there's this exchange that happens when we pray. Prayer is relational. We have a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Trinity, one God, three persons. When you pray, you're praying, Father God, in communication to his throne of grace. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, always living to intercede for us. And then we have the Holy Spirit, because when you put your trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you. All of us get stuck in prayer. Amen? Amen. Prayer's a challenge for all of us. Amen? Amen? We're all growing in prayer, amen? So instead of guilt and shame, no, we have the Holy Spirit who intercedes as well with groans and words we can't express and the Holy Spirit is helping us when we pray. This is relational and this is supernatural. When we pray, we come with worries and fears and God gives us his peace to transcend our hearts and our mind and all understanding and guard us. We come to God with confusion that's in the culture and God gives clarity and wisdom. We come to God discouraged and God gives us boldness. We come to God in weakness and God gives us power. This is through prayer. We access more of God and then we give God access to us. And God transforms us when we pray. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Well, how do you receive from God? You ask and open your heart. Jesus stands at the door and knocks and you say, come in, Lord, take over, Lord. I wanna receive more of your word, your presence, your goodness, your hope today. And you receive and receive and receive from the Lord. You say, how much should we receive? Right up to the point where you're overflowing. That's how you know you've received. Are you overflowing with love? Would your family say, you're overflowing with love? Well, then you know you're receiving. If not, then you need to receive a little more. What about joy? Receive a little more if you're running dry on joy. God doesn't run out of joy. What about peace? Well, if you don't have the shalom of God, you don't have shalom in your home, it's time to go to the Prince of Peace and receive more. What we're missing, God gives us and we receive. Now, there's a... There's a word in the Bible, consecrate. In Joshua chapter three, God tells the people, there's different points in the Bible where they're about to soar. Joshua chapter three, after a generation in the wilderness, they're gonna soar into the promised land. God says, consecrate yourselves from about to do great things. 84 days, God's about to do some great things. So consecrate, which means set apart, which means distance yourself, break it, through Jesus' name, break the patterns of the world. Get rid of the lies in your head. The patterns of sin broken in Jesus' name. Set apart, offering ourselves. What is worship? A couple songs? No, no. Songs are an expression of worship, a language of the soul. But real worship is when we offer ourselves. It's a response to God's goodness and faithfulness and holiness. And we bow down, we offer ourselves. And as we consecrate, as we set ourselves apart from this world to be different in the world and not of this world, then what's God gonna do? He's gonna do incredible things in us and through us because we wanna be with Jesus, we wanna become like Jesus, and we wanna be leading people to Jesus. And let's take that step together. It begins 
with receiving. To receive and to rely. What does that mean? You will never graduate from reliance. In fact, the more you know the Lord, the wiser you become, and the more you see just how much every day you need his presence and word and love and peace, and he will overflow you. Those who put their hope in the Lord, they will overflow. God is the God of hope, and he will give you joy and peace and hope overflowing through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 15, 13. So some of us just need to start there with a fresh vision of receiving and start to open up to all the Lord wants to give us because if you don't have it, you can't share it. You can't take people deeper than you go with Jesus yourself. So it really starts by receiving, and we don't have to run around on empty all the time. God wants to fill us. The biblical picture is a filling. So this is the receiving. It begins there. Then it steps into our calling, the second part of soaring. You are a witness, ambassador, minister, and priest. That's who you are in the Lord. That's your identity. We did a conversation with the elders this week, and we talked about these four words. A witness means you're sharing about what you've experienced and how Jesus has changed your life. That word, the root word, is martyr, which means you would even be willing to die for your faith. You're witnessing. You can't deny what's good and true. And that's a witness. Also, ambassador. Ambassador is a representative. Uh, Sometimes there's ambassadors from a nation. We are citizens of heaven, and we represent Jesus where we live, work, learn, and play. And when you abide with Jesus, people are going to see Jesus in you. And it's going to be powerful. And then we also are ministers. A minister is a servant and also a leader, servant leader, leading people to God, quick to serve, eager to serve, not to be served, but to serve, ministers. And then we also are priests, the Bible says, a kingdom of priests. And that means, again, bringing people to God, praying for people, but also uh, bringing God's word to people. In that role, that combination right there, what God is saying is that we're all in full-time ministry. All of God's people. And this is a powerful truth. Let me unpack it this way. Cultural Christianity says that you fill a building and the church is the building. And the people come into the church because they come into a building. That's not the vision. Here's the vision. God's going to fill all of his people with the Holy Spirit. And did you know your body's the temple? Well, what does that mean? You're the church. Your body is the building. And what does that mean? Instead of having one church, and we're grateful for Grace Community Church, the 5,000 people in our database are about there. I don't know what the exact number is. What we have is actually 5,000 churches. And instead of just gathering and trying to compartmentalize it into one building, one hour, one day, no, this is 24-7. God has 5,000 churches bringing the love of Jesus all across the sound all week long. That, That teaching is really key to soaring. And you might think, well, I can't do that on my own. None of us can. And that's why Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That word power, the root word is dunamis, which is the same root word for dynamite. Jesus is not saying, oh, you're gonna receive just a little bit of power when you receive the Holy Spirit. Well, some of you are gonna receive, I don't know, kind of a medium amount of power. It's not what Jesus says. You're gonna receive supernatural power power when you receive the Holy Spirit. Not timidity and fear. That doesn't come from God, but power and love through the Holy Spirit. Now, when you think about the Holy Spirit, some of us have had some false teaching, so it's, we're a little confused or seen it, the teaching manipulated, and there's been barking and weird stuff that's not in the Bible, okay? That's not where we're going here. Uh, but others just feel kind of cautious or like, I can't really trust the Holy Spirit. I don't know the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, it's going to be a wonderful opportunity to grow in our relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We worship all three. We trust all three. We need all three. We love all three. And the fullness is what God wants to give to us. Now, when you talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, I have a visual today. And sometimes visuals help me process some of these theological truths. And I'm going to start with a phone because... Most of us probably have a phone. 
right? Uh, the average in our culture right now is to spend about seven to eight hours a day on devices. And so what we're saying is let's shift. Instead of all that time and consumed with the phone, what about a relationship with God and spending time with God and lingering there? Now, as it relates to a phone, there's incredible technology and apps and potential. And absolutely, use your phone to connect with people, love people, build up people in the faith. It's got great potential. But did you ever notice a a phone is not self-sufficient? With all the incredible technology and all the different apps, and I've got a lot of them, I'm grateful for my phone, but it's not self-sufficient. During the day, I'm watching the power levels and they keep going down all day long. And some people have a phone that's out of power. I got a parallel here going on with our walk with God. Some people are kind of out of power. Some people just have a little bit of power left. Some people are kind of like screensaver mode, like technically on, but like not really on, but technically on. And some of us know that like power's running low and we're not sure if we're gonna get a recharge. So what do we do? We shift into low power mode. Anyone do that besides me? When you see your phone going down to about 15%, Low power mode. Some of us are been in low power mode spiritually for a long time, long time. It's like, are you serving? No, I got to ration it. I'm in low power mode. Are you sharing your faith? I only do that about once every five years because I'm in low power mode. Are you going to pray? No, I'm running low power mode. We've been doing low power mode Christianity, cultural Christianity, settling for that junk for a long time. And God has something much better. He didn't design us to play it safe and and to have that scarcity mindset and be afraid of people and in low power mode. So what do we have? We know that we all need to be recharged and there are chargers. Here's a charger. I was visiting, our family went on vacation last week, visiting friends in Port Ludlow. I forgot my charger there. So I realized it and said, can I get my charger back, right? Who wants to go a week without their charger? Like we know we got to keep our phones charged. So they brought it back. And uh, you know, if you plug that in and then you plug it into an outlet, now the recharging starts. And you see people like, oh good, I'm going to get more power. I've seen people at the airport like scrambling, like where's the outlet? Where's the outlet? There's like four of them running, trying to get the last outlet or like on the floor, trying to like see if this outlet works, right? We are a culture that's just like, I need a recharge. I need a recharge. Well, sometimes you're not near an outlet. And so what are you gonna do? You need a recharge. Well, through technology, we've got options. And here's one piece right here. What's that for? A car, a car. The front knows about charging up the phones. So now if you're in your car, you can charge your phone and you're getting the recharge while you're in your car. What does that tell us? God will meet you in your car. The Holy Spirit will fill you in your car. You don't have to wait a whole week till Sunday to come here and get recharged. God will do it in the car. And you say, well, what if I don't have a car and I don't have that piece? I don't have an outlet. Well, what do I do at that point? Let me tell you, God has designed, we got a power bar right here. This is portable charger. And you can just bring that along. And now look what happens. The Holy Spirit, portable charging is going on. This is 24 seven. The Holy Spirit makes a difference, a power source you don't have. And you say, well, what if it's not just about me, but it's about we, what would that look like? I'm telling you, there are mega chargers. We got mega chargers together. I don't know what the name for this thing is, but I think we just call this a life group. That's what we call it. We're calling this a life group because there's place for everybody to connect it and be filled with the Spirit of God. See, we're in a culture right now where we're always checking our phones. How much power do I have? How much power do I have? We're looking up at the upper right. How much power do I have? That is not the key indicator of your joy and peace right there. But I'll tell you what is, how much of God's presence and power is in my life today. I'm running out. I leak We all run out. We all get discouraged. When you want to soar, we're all going to experience turbulence. But the supply, God's faithfulness, his goodness, we worship a God who never runs out of power. He doesn't. (laughs) 
and there's going to be some soaring going on. And I, I got to set this down and um, look at verse 11, Acts 1, 11. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus ascended into heaven and there's a promise he will come back. That's not a maybe hope, that's a guaranteed hope. We're getting closer every day. And this is what the message is from heaven. Don't just keep staring up at the clouds. Go and soar. Go and do what Jesus told you to do. Don't sit around in committees and just try to figure out the math of like, what's the exact day Christ will return? None of us know the exact day. But the Bible says, be ready. It's not about the exact day. It's about soaring until he comes. And it was a redirect from heaven. The space between heaven and earth was thin. Jesus ascended. Angels are communicating. Then we're gonna have Pentecost. Now the Holy Spirit coming from heaven. The space between heaven and earth is thinning. Our prayer is that God, may your will be done. May it be done on earth as it is in heaven. And and we wanna be so aware of God's presence during the day in what he's called us to do. And it's a redirect from heaven. Now I'm going to admit, uh, confess that for myself, for a lot of churches in America, we have not done a great job of encouraging, equipping, and empowering God's people. And far too often it's been a, oh, just come. And it's been all about Sunday mornings. And then what else is happening Sunday morning? And what we haven't done is empower. That's the heart of this 84 days, is so that you might soar. What our staff team, this is Ephesians chapter four, what our team is committed to is provide whatever we can for you to help you soar in your faith. And that's the posture that's biblical. And we're trying to figure it out with you. We're doing this journey together. And uh, that's our heart as we enter into this. I think that's the heart of the beginning of Acts as well and what God's doing. In Acts chapter 2, here we have Pentecost. Now God's going to, here comes the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly the blowing of a violent wind, a wind. An eagle doesn't flap. An eagle harnesses the power of the wind. Nicodemus was religious. And Jesus said, the Holy Spirit moves like the wind. You can't stop the wind. You just receive and move in the power of the Spirit. There's a fresh wind right now in 2024. And this wind, it came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated, came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The Holy Spirit always existed. And the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, many stories of what the Holy Spirit is doing. Pentecost is like the grand opening. Have you ever seen a store that's officially opened? And then, after a little while, there's a grand opening. Pentecost, the grand opening for all God's people. And the Spirit poured out. And we can all, I pray that we can all celebrate this passage. You see, sadly, what happens in the body of Christ is we read something like speaking in tongues, and then there's 20 different opinions about that. And then we make this whole passage about speaking in tongues and some of the differences in the minors. Don't overfocus on a bunch of minors and then get off track Focus on the majors. The majors is that God's spirit is for all of us. God says be filled. And the Christian life is all about being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the major thrust of this passage. God wants to empower his people. Now you think, well, we're going to celebrate that. Well, not everyone's going to celebrate that. In Acts chapter 2, verse 13, look at the reaction. Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Those who don't understand scripture and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they just start to mock and ridicule and they don't understand. And I'm telling you, when you start loving Jesus, you're going to be passionate about the Lord and people are going to say, oh, you're too into Jesus. And then you're going to choose the purity of the Lord and people are going to say, oh, you're no fun. You've got a greater joy, but you're just not doing the sinful stuff they're doing. You've got a purpose now from the Lord. And people, when they mock you and they misunderstand you, don't hold it against them. Don't be in pride. You just pray, Father, forgive them. I was atheist. I had no clue about any of this stuff, but God still saved me and rescued me. And the story's not over. And so you just walk in the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit will be that love, joy, and peace. And people will see that you're filled. They're going to see Jesus in you. You say, well, in Seattle, it's tough to do that. Like research has shown us recently, this is the 
spiritually darkest city in America, the least amount of faith out of any city in America, here's the good news. In a dark contest, it's easy for the light to shine. In a dark context, it's easy for light to shine. If the room's already bright, one more light might not be noticeable. But when the room is dark and now you have a light, it's like, what's going on around here? Seattle just made it easy for you to be who you are. The light of the world, shine the light of Jesus because the light overcomes the darkness. Well, if you're feeling defeated and discouraged and you know you messed up in the past, that's just how Peter felt. But here's the good news. God transforms failures and turns them into victories. Peter steps up in Acts chapter 2. Now he's filled with the Spirit. And this is what he says. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. May it be so, Lord. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. What's going on? Peter's referring to the Old Testament Job. What's happening in Pentecost? God predicted it, declared it hundreds of years ago. What's happening through the Holy Spirit now? God already declared it and decreed it. It's unstoppable what God's doing. So don't resist the Holy Spirit, but don't quench the Holy Spirit. Trust the Holy Spirit. And some people probably thought, well, who's this Peter to tell me? Wasn't Peter, wasn't this the guy that told Jesus not to go to the cross? Yeah, that was Peter. Didn't, didn't Jesus then rebuke him and say, get behind me, Satan? Yeah, that's true. That was Peter. Wasn't Peter the confused guy in the transfiguration when it was all about Jesus' glory and Peter was saying, like, I can build three huts right now. I can build three pretty cool huts. And, and Jesus said, no, it's not about the huts. What, wasn't that Peter that when Jesus went to wash his feet said, no, Jesus, don't wash my feet? Uh, and then wasn't it Peter who said, Jesus, wash my whole body? And, and Jesus said, no, I'm just doing your feet here, Peter. Uh, <laughs> Wasn't that Peter that was kind of like, Jesus, you don't know anything about fish. And then Jesus said, lower the nets. And then there were so many fish, Peter couldn't pick them up. And he just said, get away from me, Jesus. I'm a sinful man. I mean, wasn't that Peter who pulled out his sword and sliced off Malchus's ear that fell off and Jesus had to pick it back up and, and heal Malchus in that ear? I mean, wasn't this Peter who said, I'll never deny you. When the disciples were quiet, he said, I'll never. The others will, but I never will. Until what happened three times, young girls said, do you know Jesus? He said, I don't know Jesus. And before we point fingers at Peter, he did that three times. In this room, we've done it 3,000 times. When we could have said Jesus and we said nothing. And so we're not here to guilt shame Peter, us, anybody else. What we're highlighting here is that Jesus restored Peter. We see a picture in Peter that's relatable because all of us know what this is like. This is a picture of us without the Holy Spirit. But when Peter now is filled with the Holy Spirit, he is fearless. He's bringing the word. He doesn't care about public opinion. He cares about people's lives and souls. And he knows who saves. And he can't be silent anymore. And he'll bring forward the word. He's going to soar. He's done with with cultural Christianity. He's ready to soar for the glory of God. This is the same Peter and not the same Peter. You're gonna be the same person and not the same person when you're filled with the Holy Spirit because God can take our lowest failures and there's an ascension that happens that God is going to do far beyond anything Peter could imagine. 3,000 that day as he brings this message. He didn't know what the results would be. None of us know the results. But be faithful and trust God with the results. Look at chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. We need to be intentional to bless our children and then our grandchildren. And then in Grace Community Church, the spiritual children. And what God's going to do in generations, this is what Peter's declaring God is doing a new work. Do you think that was um, easy to have 3,000 new people following Jesus? Do you think they had no rough edges? Do you, do you think the disciples had this perfect plan? Like, oh yeah, probably 3,000 will, will, will come into the Lord and then, and then we'll just, you know, our assimilation program that we, we've thought through already. They weren't ready for any of that. 
What are we going to do if 3,000 people over the next 84 days hear about Jesus, want to connect in life groups, want to be part of a community? What are we going to do? It's going to be messy. But you know what they decided? Even though it's messy, we can trust God. And you know what they realized? All hands on deck. This can't be just a couple of people. We can't just have a, a committee, these five people at the Connecting Center, and they handle everything. No, this is together. The body, everyone's a priest, everyone's a minister, everyone's an ambassador, and we're gonna have all hands on deck and figure it out together. This has always been God's plan. It's biblical Christianity, it's new, but it's not really new, it's ancient. It's just a new yes to Jesus and soaring. Soaring includes devotion. And look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Notice the word devoted. They devoted. That's a decision, a commitment, priorities. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. Let me ask you, what are you devoted to in life? What would your friends say you're devoted to? If they picked your top three, what are you really devoted to? What would your kids say that you're really devoted to? For the community, they devoted to God's presence, God's word, to prayer, to love in each other. They were devoted. They were willing to die for their friends. They cared. They prayed. They opened up their homes with hospitality. They were all about love and their neighbors. They were devoted. See, it's a decision to soar. It's a decision to cultivate habits. It's a decision that's different than the pattern of the world. And you can't keep saying yes to the world and yes to Jesus. Soaring happens when you say yes to Jesus and you let him write the script. He leads, we follow. And there's a calling that comes with it that's glorious, that's rich. What is that? To be with Jesus, to become more like Jesus, and to be leading people to the goodness and hope of Jesus. That's what God's called us to do. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 47, this last verse. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were praising God. They were enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number those who were being saved daily. Now, if you're looking at this and thinking, oh, their context was so easy, they have no idea what it's like to be in America in 2024. Let me tell you, their soaring did not happen while everything was easy peasy. Right here, they've already got so many people that want to kill them constantly. And 11 out of the 12 leaders are going to be killed. Nothing. Soaring is not about easy circumstances. Soaring is about when the crows come and attack and peck and steal the food of the eagles. The eagles ascend by putting their hope in the Lord and the crows can't handle the higher altitudes. That was the choice of abiding with Jesus. And I'm going to ask you a question here before we worship. The question is, are you willing to leave the nest? You can't soar in the nest. Are you willing to leave what's comfortable? Because if you're not, there's not going to be a lot of soaring going on the next 84 days. So are you really willing? Why? Because God is here. God has the power to soar. God wants to empower you with his presence to soar like never before and new heights. But you can't stay in the nest. We're going to sing this song now, and there's a generational element to this song. I mentioned kids and grandkids. This is a prayer we're going to pray. We're starting in prayer. And we're thinking about generations in Auburn. If you don't have biological kids, think about the spiritual generations in your church, on your family tree spiritually. Think about the generations in America right now and how much is on the line and what a free fall we've been in morally and spiritually. We're praying this prayer now as we start 84 days of soaring. This is what we're crying out to God. Let's stand up. Let's seek the Lord. Let's ask God to do what only he can do.